overdispersion is a phenomenon that occurs when the model underestimates the variance in the outcome. This means the estimated relationship may still be accurate, but the spread around this relationship is underestimated. When a model fails to capture the variance in the outcome, standard errors will be too small, which causes p-values to be biased towards significance, and confidence or prediction intervals will be optimistically narrow. Why would a model underestimate the variance? How can you detect this? And what can you do about it? That is the topic of this video. In the previous videos, we saw how every GLM is essentially just a probability distribution, with a mean that changes as we move along the explanatory variable. In case of normally distributed errors, the story ends here, and we have basically described the whole process. But for Poisson and binomial GLMs, notice how the mean is not the only thing that changes. There is a fixed relationship between mean and variance. So when you use these, implicitly, you assume a relationship between the mean and the variance of your outcome. But just because we assume something does not mean it holds up in real data. At any given value of the explanatory variable, the outcome may be more spread out than expected under the chosen probability distribution. This is called overdispersion, an excess of variance in the outcome compared to what you'd expect under the chosen model. So what causes overdispersion? Remember, the Poisson distribution is the distribution of independent counts occurring at a fixed rate, and a binomial distribution is the distribution of successes out of the number of independent trials with a fixed probability of success. Notice the similarity between these two definitions. This already reveals two potential sources of overdispersion. The first is dependency among your observations, and the second is some external factor influencing the outcome which is not included in the model. Using the Poisson distribution as an example, let's see why these cause the variance to increase. Truly independent counts might occur if we have two equally sized apple trees, completely separate from each other and kept under constant, identical laboratory settings. Correlated counts might occur if the trees are grown outside on the same patch of land in close proximity of each other. This way, they'll be similarly affected by rainfall, herbivory, soil composition, and so on. This tends to cause positive correlation between their counts, because any change in conditions will likely affect both trees similarly. Let's see what that looks like. Let's simulate 100 years of data for both situations, each with the same fixed rate per tree. On the x-axis we'll display the years, and on the y-axis the total number of apples. These are the results for both conditions. On the left, there is a lot less fluctuation in the counts than on the right. But why does that happen? We can see it by giving a different color to the trees. On the left, the performance of one tree is completely independent of the other, so the chance that both trees do really well in the same year is quite small. On the right, the story is very different. A favorable year, with lots of rainfall, affects both trees simultaneously. So an exceptionally high total is a lot less exceptional. The opposite is also true. Very poor conditions, like a year of drought, means neither tree will yield many apples. So a very small total, or even zero, is a lot more likely on the right than it is on the left. Positively correlated counts vary together, and as a result, the spread in the total is a lot larger than what a Poisson distribution would predict. So there we have the first major cause for overdispersion. Your observations may not be truly independent. The second reason is a lot easier to explain. In fact, we only need one tree per situation. On the left, we now have a single tree with a fixed rate of five apples per year. Individual years differ randomly, but the average remains at a nice constant five. And hence the predicted Poisson distribution will closely match the observed distribution of counts. On the right then, imagine the tree is still growing. Now we not only have random differences between individual years, but also a steady increase. If we don't include this effect of age in the model, 
the resulting Poisson distribution will grossly underestimate the actual spread in observed counts. So there we have a second major cause for overdispersion. Some important factor that influences the outcome is not included in the model. There are two more potential causes I want to mention. The first is outliers. Unless your sample is very large, an outlier can have a substantial influence on the total variance. As a word of warning though, don't be too quick to jump to this conclusion. Remember that counts are skewed, so extreme observations will happen more often than in a normal distribution. Try not to think of outliers as extreme in terms of the outcome, but instead as very different from the observed trend. Like this for example, or like this. A good way to assess outlyingness is by using visual diagnostics, which I'll show in the next video. The last reason for overdispersion I want to mention in this video is something that is particularly common in count data. Zero inflation. This means the probability distribution isn't necessarily more diffuse, but that there specifically is an excess in zeros in the outcome. These will pull the estimated mean towards zero, but that obviously worsens the fit. And since a lot of observations are now further away from the mean, this increases the variance. Unaddressed zero inflation will result in overdispersion. So there we have four potential causes for overdispersion. Next, how can you detect overdispersion? It turns out there's a very simple check you can use as a first indication. Two byproducts of fitting a GLM in any statistical software are the residual deviance and the residual degrees of freedom. In an ideal situation, with zero over or under dispersion, the ratio of these two numbers should equal one. Is the ratio substantially larger than one? Then you have over dispersion. Is the ratio substantially smaller than one? Then you have under dispersion. This provides a rough indication. A more precise answer can be obtained by using significance tests for over dispersion. In the description, you can find links to example codes demonstrating how to use these in R or in Python. Now that we know what it is and how to detect it, how can we deal with overdispersion? Let's create a quick overview of the different causes and how to address them. Dependency means observations are not truly independent, like the Poisson and binomial distribution expect. This might happen because observations are physically close to each other, or even because they are measurements of the same thing, like in repeated measurements designs and in time series. One way to deal with dependency is by simply incorporating it into the model. A popular type of model that can do this is called a mixed model. It is not always possible to explicitly model dependency. Sometimes observations are correlated, but no variable in our data set can help explain why. In such cases, we can use a probability distribution that has a separate parameter for the dispersion. For counts, we can use the negative binomial distribution, and for ratios, the beta binomial distribution. Another trick we can use is called an observation level random effect. This essentially assumes each observation comes from its own distribution. A third option, often mentioned in discussions on overdispersion, is quasi likelihood. Personally though, I don't recommend using this, because quasi-Poisson and quasi-binomial are not real probability distributions. These are just tricks to correct the standard errors of an overdispersed model. Not having a real probability distribution complicates a lot of things down the line. For example, we cannot use the simulation-based diagnostics covered in the next video. But this limitation has not prevented quasi-likelihood from being popular among practitioners, which is why I wanted to mention it. The next problem we discussed, some external influence, happens when there is another variable that has a substantial effect on the outcome but is not part of the model. This means the rate of the Poisson distribution, or the probability of success of the binomial distribution, is no longer fixed for a given value of the explanatory variable. Fortunately, the best solution to this issue is very simple. Include this external influence in the model. Add another explanatory variable. But what if we don't have any information on this external influence? What if we can't simply add another explanatory variable? In this case, we have to be extra sure we still trust the estimated relationship, which we can assess through diagnostics. 
Once we have convinced ourselves that the only issue is over dispersion, we can use the solutions described above, like a distribution with a separate dispersion parameter. The third problem we discussed was that of outliers, a small number of observations which strongly deviate from the trend observed in the rest of the data. As a general rule in analysis, do not remove outliers just because they are outlying. An outlier might be a valid observation. It may reflect reality in a way your model did not pick up on. If there are multiple outliers in the same direction, chances are these are not outliers, but the estimated relationship is not accurate. In this case, consider adding a nonlinear term to the model or using a regression spline. If you do think the estimated relationship is accurate, one alternative in the presence of outliers is using robust standard errors. These are not affected by outliers as much because they allow the variance to be different between observations. Under very specific conditions, removal of outliers can be the right course of action. These include impossible values, like negative counts, values that differ due to errors in experimentation, like forgetting to put something in the freezer, or observations which are incomparable to the rest. For example, because only one tree was of a different species than all the others. Failing that, leave outliers in the data and use robust standard errors. The last problem we discussed was that of zero inflation, which simply means there are more zeros in the outcome than expected under the chosen model. If zeros can happen for more than one reason, use a zero inflated model. If some event must happen in order to count a non-zero number, use a hurdle model. Before we wrap this video up, there's one last topic I want to discuss. What if the opposite happens and my model overestimates the variance in the outcome? Is that possible? Is there such a thing as underdispersion? The answer is yes, although almost always underdispersion is a sign of overfitting and not a naturally occurring phenomenon. Let me give you an example before I explain why. Suppose we keep chickens and we count how many eggs they lay. If every chicken has its own little house with its own little feeding tray, then it's reasonable to assume the number of eggs from each chicken is independent. But what if the chickens are in the same pen, sharing the same feeding tray with a limited amount of food? Now there is competition for food. If one chicken eats more, the others necessarily eat less. Assuming eating more means laying more eggs, then this competition causes a negative correlation between counts from different chickens. Sounds reasonable, right? So why is this so much rarer? These chickens in the same pen are still similarly affected by other changes in conditions. Temperature, water quality, and disease will likely still affect the chickens at the same time. So even if we have a potential cause for negative correlation between counts, there are still many potential factors causing positive correlation. These may somewhat cancel each other out, or even push us back into the direction of overdispersion. So underdispersion is a real phenomenon, but not something you encounter often. What about the other reason? Why does overfitting result in underdispersion? The name already gives us a hint. If you fit too much of the spread in the data, there will be too little left. In practical terms, if you keep adding variables to your model, eventually you are no longer fitting any real trend in the data. Essentially, you are now fitting the noise. And since we're fitting the noise, there will be less noise left than expected, resulting in underdispersion. In case of overfitting, simplify your model. That might mean removing interactions, explanatory variables, or if you're using regression splines, reduce the degrees of freedom. If you're not sure your model is overfitting, you can find out through cross-validation. But that is a topic for another video. So there we have causes, detection, and remediation of overdispersion. In the description, you can find example scripts for detecting overdispersion in R and in Python. If anything remains unclear, feel free to ask in the comments.